Today's interview is with Oren Claff. He's raised over $2 billion in investments for his companies. Oren's the best selling author of Pitch Anything and Flip the Script Getting People to Think Your Idea is Their Idea. It's, you know, as I listen to, I don't know, two to four books per week or so on Audible, this is one of my all time favorites. And I don't say that lightly. So definitely check out Flip the Script. You know, companies all over the world call him to help craft and deliver a pitch that will help them raise funds that will change their company. And so you can go to pitchmastery.com, pitchanything.com to learn more and check out what Oren has done. And he breaks down his process step by step. Uh, big shout out to a few people uh, before the interview. Uh, Amy Freeze, uh, who helped put this together and coordinate this with uh, Oren and myself and Guy, who um, does a lot of work with Oren as well. Check out their website, you know, pitchanything.com and pitchmastery.com. Also big shout out to Chris Snyder. Chris Snyder, you know, is kind of the inspiration behind this interview because we were talking about, he attended one of Oren's um, events and um, just was raving about it. And Chris Snyder runs Snyder Showdown podcast and owns the uh, banks.com actually. So check that out. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of and some you've never heard of, you know, um, or when I had Ron Popeil on. A lot of people have never heard of Ron Popeil. Um, yeah. He's the king of infomercials, one of the best pitch men. He sold billions of dollars of product and he's famous for saying, but wait, there's more. What I love hearing is the stories where he would talk about how he would wake up at four in the morning, he'd start buying produce, setting up his table in the streets of Chicago, selling the Vegematic. I I love those stories. Um, Chris Voss, former FBI hostage negotiator, talks about some of the most stressful situations when negotiating for people's lives in his book, Never Split the Difference, which is one of my favorites of all time. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Oren Claff in a second, who he also has one of my favorite books of all time. Um, also, P90X founder Tony Horton talks about how he made money. You know, before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X, he made money as a street mime. So, and I love hearing the kind of the challenge stories. And he would put his hat on the street, and he would make food and rent money by doing street mime, street performing. Uh, I love those stories. So, check out those. Many more at InspiredInsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise Twenty Five, which I co-founded with my business partner John Corcoran and. At Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners and help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. And, you know, podcasting for me, yes, like it's it's one of the, been the best thing I've done for my business and my life because of the relationships. I've gone to people's weddings. I've gone on family vacations, but it's a lot more personal for me. Actually, um, my it was inspired by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, and him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany, and they were the only members of their family to survive. And, you know, the reason his words and legacy live on is because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him. And yeah. I put that interview on my about page. You can watch it on inspiredinsider.com on the about page. And, you know, I can be um, inspired and motivated and have appreciation and gratitude by watching that interview multiple times a year. So yes, I think podcasting is the best thing you could do for your business, but it leaves a legacy for you and your guest. So if you have questions about it, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25media.com. We've been doing it for over 10 years. We've got Berkshire Hathaway Company and many more. So without further ado, I'm super right, excited. Is the interview going to start anytime? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to run down to Starbucks. You keep going. You know, the funny thing is I watched an interview, Oren, and uh, you called the guy a Unabomber. And so I'm like, I'm scared to interview this guy. Like you told him, I don't even think I'd let you in my office dressed like that. I don't know if you remember that. So it's the first no, time I think I've, I've laughed on an interview show. You know, and, and uh, sometimes you laugh, sometimes you cry. Like you mentioned, uh, you know, Chris Voss and Tony Horton and, um, uh, Ron Papilla. I mean, don't take this the wrong way, but fuck those guys. 
So, but I'll tell you why, right? Uh, nice guys, nice families and everything. They, they are, st- that category of guy, Chris is a fine guy, Tony's a wonderful guy, um, uh, Ron's a fucking lunatic, but that, that category of guy is stretching their experience that they had in hucking or selling or infomercial or selling juice mixers, you know, or FBI hostage negotiations. They're extending it too far to business, right? So they're saying, you know, not to be mean to Chris, right? But his thing is to say, you know, is, is uh, his, his signature phrase is to ask somebody you're negotiating with, um, how should I do that? How can I do that? How should I do that? Right? I go to into a little background on me. I help companies raise money. So I go to venture capital. I go to private equity. I go to banks. Right? And we're talking about $5 million, $10 million, $30 million, $50 million. Right? And so if I'm talking to Bank of America or TA Partners or, you know, a private equity group about a $30 million financing. And they propose a term, you know, liquidate, 2X liquidated preferences in a term sheet. Right? And I don't like that. And I say, how am I supposed to do that? They will say, excuse me, what, what did you say? I said, well, how am I supposed to do that? And they're going to say, that, okay, that's not our fucking problem. Are you still in this meeting? Are you listening to us? Like, that is not how finance works. It's not how business works. It may be how hostage negotiation works, right? There may be a different catch line in how you sell juicers and vegetables, but there is a very finite route to pitching a real deal with people who know what they're doing. Um, and so there is this, this, this sort of genre of people who had tremendous success. I mean, Tony probably has more money than I do. He's got a bigger plane, you know, a better house, bigger house, more maids, uh, uh, <laughs> um, you know, more islands that he owns, whatever. Okay. But in the domain that probably people listening to this podcast are, on, are B2B sales and B2B finance and raising capital, there is a very narrow window that you can approach a client or a buyer or an investor or a bank. And within that frame, there are very specific things that you can do. And almost everything that sells juicers and almost everything that frees hostages, which is important, I don't mean to be mean to those guys, and almost everything that does to sell you know, um, um, uh, fitness subscriptions, and almost everything that's needed to sell, uh, you know, do marketing, doesn't work. In fact, the box that I'm talking about, B2B sales and finance, is upside down land. The things that work in marketing, the things that work in commercials, the things that work in in sales, the things that work in consumer sales, um, backwards. They don't attract people to you, they push people away. Because in these environments, you can only attract people. And that's probably where I would start. In the world of B2B, the set of rules uh, is basically people want what they can't have. Mm People chase that which moves away from them, and people only value that which they pay for. And that covers investing. So, so if you think about your pitch or your sale, and you start to frame the, it within the scope of those ideas, you'll, you'll, things will improve. So uh, th- those environments are very sensitive to knowing the domain, knowing what order to put things in, what content the buyer needs to be able to check the boxes and buy and how much detail to give in the pitch. Once you know those things in that environment, uh, uh, then you can get control over the buyer. So people want what they can't have, people chase that which moves away from them and people only value that which they pay for and then we can start to unpack why B2B buyers actually buy, why investors and companies and startups and growing companies actually invest and how banks put out money Uh, But it's very different from from these other environments. You can stretch too far from sales into real B2B. You know, Warren, thanks for sharing that with, you know, again, I was mentioning, you know, flip the script. I think every single person, whether they have a business or not, should get that book. And I have on my whiteboard uh, three terms, um, which is status alignment, plain vanilla, and motivation of buyers, just so it reminds me on a daily basis of those three things. But you mentioned something about pushing people away. There's a story in Flip the Script where you're selling really high-end car parts, and you went into um, more of like a rural area, and they weren't pushing people away enough. Right. So what's the balance of pushing people away and 
I won't ruin the punchline of the, of the book, but actually being authentic to who you are. Yeah, yeah. So this is the issue. Uh, you could tattoo this on your arm, you know, if you, I don't, I don't have tattoos, but if you want to get one, here's a good one to get. You can cover it with flowers or whatever. Neediness kills deals. Yeah. So when you're cloistering, when you are approaching, when you are in somebody's face, when you are asking seven times for the sale, when you are constantly present, when you are there and asking, you know, and, and constantly approaching, it triggers avoidance behavior because it's neediness, right? So that's on one side. Now, on the other side, you have to control people, right? So um, you, you can't just, you know, make them a pitch and then walk away and hope they ask to buy it, right? right? So somewhere in between giving a pitch and walking away and being too needy and too cloistering and too approaching is a gray area in which you have control. And so, yeah, in, in the book, when you, so here's the issue. If you don't have intrigue, if you don't talk about problems, if you don't frame yourself as an expert, and if you don't have story-like narratives, then all you have is the features of the product, the benefits of the product, and the price. And this is really the problem with most corporate presentations in IC. Here's the features of our product. We're number one SaaS software that provides accounting plugins um, that can reduce your IRS obligation and catch errors in your tax filing. Microsoft uses us, Oracle uses us, Intuit uses us, GE uses us. So here's all our logo. Here's the benefits you get from working with us and we have the best customer service and here's how much it is. That, so when that happens in the first five minutes, the pitch, the presentation, the sale is over. The buyer has all the information he needs to make a decision, but he doesn't need you anymore. He's got the features, he's got the benefits, he's got the price. You are no longer necessary, and he doesn't buy, he goes to the internet and go, where can I get the same thing cheaper or for free, okay? Uh, so there's gotta be a gray area in which you say, this is what we have, this is why it's valuable, right? Uh, and, and I'd like you to buy it, but I'm not sure I'm willing to give it to you. That is the area you have to be able to stand in and live in is I, I want you as an account. I love this account. I'm very interested to close this. I'm, I'm connected. I'm listening. You know, I'm very excited about this. On the other hand, there's some things here that scare me about you. Hmm. So I'm trying to figure out. Now, who would say to their client, I'm looking at you. I looked at your website. I love you guys. But there's some red flags that I got to clear up. That is when you really are in your full power as a presenter hmm. when you can say i'm interested you're willing to walk away but i'm also scared and i'm and and um so i'm willing to walk away is a very uh abrasive kind of sentiment or idea right so when, when people say to me you know and hold that over your head um you know hey i have other options i'm willing to walk away i will always say go ahead take one of your, of your other options that sounds great sounds like you have it organized right good luck Right. That's what I'll say. And most deal makers, if you hold, I'm willing to walk away over their head and overtly, they'll say, great, walk away. Right. I mean, so the way to demonstrate willingness to walk away is by saying I'm interested and pitching and saying I'm connected and I'm fully present. But there are also some things that I'd have to work out before I'd be able to do business with you. And that gives us reason for a meeting. A, a, there's not enough reason for a meeting for me to give you the features and the benefits and the price. That's a five minute meeting. Working out how we're gonna work together, the value proposition, the certainty, who we compete against, why we're the best option, who, what, why I'm credible, why the things I say that, will, that are supposed to happen in the future really will happen, how you can trust me, the, uh, the, the, uh, how good are we at solving the problems that you have? How many times have we solved them? Getting those ideas in your head, understanding why things are changing, how I'm an expert in that change, how you could be certain that the things I'm saying will happen, really will happen. Those are reasons for a meeting. Features, benefits, logos, price is not a good reason for an hour-long meeting. So I'm not sure if that's helpful. Yeah, uh, definitely is. 
you know, it makes me think, Oren, so is there a scenario in mind where the hardest deal you had to walk away from because there were just some, maybe it was, you know, it was just a deal sure. you knew would be a great deal, but there was just a few red flags. It was just tough for you to, to walk away. Is there one that sticks out for you over the years? Yeah. So I think the, again, uh, we started talking about control, right? And the way you ultimately end up controlling a deal is by your values, right? And so that it, it's not that, Hey, I'm willing to walk away if the price isn't right for me. Because I find in my experience, deals hardly ever fall apart on price. Okay. Especially in today's world, there's so much financing mechanisms available. They, they really fall apart on values. And if you walk away on price, it's very shrill and bitter, but if you walk away on values, then it's, uh, you've got a very strong, uh, moral authority and deals that you walk away because of your values tend to come back around and close as often as not deals that you walk away from because of price, uh, very often are just dead. So I would say two out of three deals that broke apart because of your values come back together. Two out of 10 deals that broke apart on price come back together. In my experience across thousands of deals, let me just turn this off because something is ringing. We don't yeah, want to worry. do that. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that I was, um, I was in a deal. Uh, the company was doing $72 million of revenue, $18 million of EBITDA, large company. Uh, we were financing the company and then selling it in a pretty large transaction and uh, everything was going smoothly. And then, then ultimately some of the senior management team of the company uh, was trying to get, well, how, how should I say, um, uh, overly uh, aggressive with their, with how they're going to treat their taxes. Right. And we would just say, you can't do that. Like the government is not confused. You sell something for a hundred million dollars. The government doesn't like, it's not like you going to DMV and reporting that you bought a car for $40,000 when you actually bought it for $60,000. You know, that's like the government can't focus on that. But when something sells for a hundred million dollars, they know, you know, how much taxes are supposed to flow out of the, the AI and the computers and everything. You know, there's just no way to get around it. And so that deal had a $6 million fee for me in it, $6 million. And as they continue to get more creative with the tax structure, I said, this is outside of my value system. And I walked away and $6 million around here buys a lot of diapers and trucks and, you know, vacations in Hawaii and top floor four seasons and, and uh, kind of wine that I like. So there's not like an extra $6 million lying around, <laughs> uh, but, but that one was incredibly painful. When something is outside of your value system, uh, um, you know, you can walk away and if it was meant to happen, it will readjust and happen. If it wasn't meant to happen, then it won't. So the value, you know, sometimes you said the value ones will come back around. Is it just the other party comes to their senses on values, something like that? I'll, I'll teach you something that is very powerful uh, in terms of uh, inserting your value system into a deal for the purpose of using it to help close the deal. Okay. And that is, when you're with a client or with you're with an investor or a buyer, you know, buyer B2B services, you know, it's really the world that I live in and, and help people. Right. It's, you know, I, I said, Jeremy, I can't work on your company harder than you will. I can't invest more in your company than you'll invest in your company. That doesn't make sense. If you won't, right. It's your company. You're going to make 20 million, 30 million, $40 million when you sell it, right? I, when you sell it, I will either make $0 or I'll make $100,000. What sense is it that I will be working harder, investing more money, trying harder to help your company than you are? We got to be in alignment here, right? And that, that has closed more projects than almost anything else because A, yes, it's aligned. Okay. Because it's usable. You can know when to use it, how, you know, how to use it. You can, there's predictable results when you say this thing and it is a way of getting control. So yes, it's a line two, it's a measure of control, but three, it's authentic and truthful. And if you really feel that way, 
So, so lots of times people will want you, you know, when you provide your services or, or whatever it is to provide the first month free or, or um, get paid on the results, right? And, and you say, it makes no sense for me to work harder than you on your company, mm -hmm. right? And that's a red flag for me. Let's figure out what's, let's figure out what's really going on here. And when you do that, now you, you, you've stripped away all the, you know, the masks and the polite conversation and the games and you're down to what's really going on. That's what I try and do is get down to what's really going on with person. I might just say, Hey, Jeremy, what's really going on here? Just tell me and we'll figure it out. If it's not right, I'm, you know, now with the phone, right? I'm so easy to get rid of. Just hang up on me. You don't even have to say goodbye. I'll understand. <laughs> Put the phone down, right? I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll pretend you, you know, went into a parking garage or you went in the wine cellar, get another bottle. Just hang I'm, I'm that easy to get rid of. Okay. If there's really something here, let's figure it out. Right. And, 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 uh, you know, and then it'll come around to price and, and there's all, all kinds of ways to, you know, handle that. But it, it's, it's, that's where alignment is. You can't ask me to send a proposal, write this thing up, figure out um, how to get you all this value, solve your problems. I don't have your problem. Okay. So what we do is, you know, we help companies uh, prepare to sell and raise money or go sell deals, right? Or, or increase sales. We don't have that problem. We're too busy. We have all the money we need. We can raise all the capital we need. You have the problem. Okay. If you'd like me to solve it. And by the way, you can have it. There's lots of people who do this, right? But I've solved your kind of problem a thousand times. It's just pushing a button. You know, I got 10 people. When I say go, all these guys scurry. They're not sort of thinking super hard and creatively and wondering how to do this. We do this all the time. It's stamping out beer cans. I know you've got a great company. It's super creative what you do. You're a special snowflake and you are. But in reality, go getting you $10 million. It's, and, and I know you, and, and we'll treat you special. And you know, you, you want to feel like a special snow. But when I turn around and turn this over to the guys, they're just stamping out beer cans. We have solved this problem thousands of times. If you want us to do it for you, then say, Oren, I love you. I love the way it works. Uh, and, and I want to have you do this. And so then they'll say something like, uh, yeah, uh, Oren, now nah, let's, let's just get started. Right. And I'll say no. So they'll, they'll ask to buy and I'll say, no, I, it doesn't work. Right. This is too hard. We're going to spend a couple months together. We're going to be both sides are going to be working on this. We're going to get an argument at some point. And for you to say, yeah, let's do it. I, right? You have to say, Oren, I really love your energy, your experience. I truly believe that we're going to make magic together and I'm really excited about working with you and I love the idea of us working together. And if you can say that or some version of that, I'm in. But until I hear that, I don't think there's enough here for us to go forward. As you can see, these, it's going to cause issues. Yeah, these, these are some of the things that are a lot better than these are our features, these are our benefits, these are our logos, these are some of our customers, here's the ROI, do you have any questions? Yeah. You know, one of the stories I love from Flip the Script, Oren, is the values you just talked about where um, I think your partner would refuse to sell, I think, a, a yeah. motorbike to one of the, the big picture films. It's, that's a great story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did, did he did not end up selling it, right? No, no. So, so I had this, ama this amazing partner, Elias. He was a famous jet ski racer. Uh, and then he became a... a competition level motorcycle racer and he sold me my i probably bought ten thousand motorcycles in the last 15 years so i was buying motorcycles from him and we became friends and then the worst idea ever is that um, i would invest in a motorcycle uh, business but it was the best idea as well right and one thing about elias is he had values he loved what he was doing and so the, the story you're talking about here, I don't mind saying there was one of the, one of the movie uh, theaters, you know, not theaters, but one of the movie production companies, you know, you would recognize her name, like it's not Sony, but like Sony came and for a movie with a famous celebrity, they said, look, we were looking for um, this Italian motorcycle that has this, you know, pedigree and we're going to, we're going to destroy it in the movie. You know, we're going to ride it off and jump it and destroy it. Uh, they're really hard to find. Elias, can you find this one? We'll pay you anything. Right? We have a movie budget. We'll pay you anything. And we need money. You know, we're a small company. 
and he put his foot down and he said, I would never be involved, no matter how much money, with destroying, there's seven of these motorcycles left in the world. I would never be involved with, so, so we let go of a quarter million dollar fee or whatever it was there, but on the other hand, all the employees, all the partners, all the industry saw that we stick to our guns. We don't just do whatever for money. And so the $250,000 or whatever it is that we walked away from not selling Sony a famous motorcycle, you know, we would made 10 times over by all the employees and all the industry knowing our word means something. We have values. They may not be perfect. They may not be everybody's values, but we have values and we stick to our guns and our word means something. When your word means something, it carries weight and strength and has transparency and integrity and value to it. And you're an expert in your domain. Then the deals will come to you. And now we're sort of full cycle back to where we began. You cannot push a deal in B2B onto investors. You have to attract them to you. What attracts people to, to other people? Values, strength, character, expertise, um, uh, domain knowledge, ability to run a meeting, ability to move quickly. And, and so all of those things give you control. Price is one form of control, but it's the worst kind. You just lower price, lower price, lower price until you um, lower price until you basically uh, have no margin left. And then you have a customer and you have revenue, but you don't have margin. And now you're frustrated and everybody gets in that position. And by the way, I'm sorry, I'm talking over you. I know you have a million questions, but no, go the, ahead. Thing saying, the, the things we're talking about here are counterintuitive. That's the world I live in. Things are counterintuitive. You think it's one way, but it's really the other. And so the reason I'm so passionate about these mistakes, because I fucking make them every single day. You have to be intentional about these things. How do I program myself to go into a meeting for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, a Zoom call, present what it is I have, attract people to it, control them in an honest, transparent, fair, kind, warm, empathetic way. But control them and end up with the deal. I meet lots of people, you know, eventually they meet me after seeing a podcast or whatever and they go, Oh, you know, I'm ordering a sandwich. And they're like, well, how, how's Warren trying to control me? Right. <laughs> uh, hey, you mind moving your car? I just got to uh, get my truck in here a little bit. Oh, what, what game is this? What frame control? What, what Vulcan mind meld is Warren? I'm like, no, I'm just trying to park my fucking truck and you're moving. So, so this stuff is very intentional. You cannot hold it for your entire life because it's counterintuitive. It's not how closing deals is not what humans are built to do. Built to eat, mate, kill. That's it. Um, uh, you know, supply side economics as it relates to a $50 million, you know, security offering in which you privatize both the A and B and split the, the C series into a tiered financing of MES, senior, and equity is not what humans were built to do. It requires a huge amount of intention and focus. So the things we're talking about here, you know, programming, the people want what they can't have. We, 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 we program to um, believe in reciprocity. I'm nice to you. I show you all the details of the deal. Um, I show you what my bottom line pricing is. I tell you, you know, all the features, what the, uh, you know, the success stories, the downside, and, and, and I just tell you what it is I have, right? Uh, and then I expect, in, in reciprocity, I expect you to take me at face value, to trust me, and to make an honest counteroffer. It's not how people work. My brother is an engineer. And he says, or not, you know, we're totally different. He says, I don't do any of this framing and game and, and control and positioning and, and um, intentional and value propositions and programming. I just tell people what it is we have and if they want, you know, and I don't play games. I say, Tamir, it's my brother's name. You play the I don't play games game. <laughs> I'll tell you what that is like. Uh, sorry, I let you. I, 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 um, I'm just talking so much, but uh, uh, just a couple things occurred in my mind. Like Australians culturally, they come here to the U.S. We help them out a lot because they have a problem in Australia culturally. They they 
the way they pitch is they go, right, mate, this is what we have. This is the pricing. This is what it is. We just deliver it to you. We're good guys. You can look us up. Um, we're very honest about it. And that's, you know, this is the pricing and this is all we have. In the United States, we go, what are you up to, motherfucker? <laughs> Something's going on here. And, and, and we just take that as a baseline and then we try and negotiate below that because we assume that is, you know, that, that is the, the line. Um, so frame control, moral authority, neediness, alignment, scarcity, uh, expertise, pre-wired ideas. These are all things that are, are required to come together as humans and have somebody trust you, believe in you, want to work with you be excited about both your product or your service and you as a person and yeah. want to chase the opportunity of working with you as opposed to grinding you down on price as a commodity. It is programmatic. It is not natural. I can tell you people who it looks like they do it naturally uh, and there are, you know, sort of are these set of naturals. There is uh, a, 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 when you unpack or reverse engineer what they're doing, it is very programmatic. You will not see really naturals doing things in some random way that doesn't fit the psychological model that I've laid out and flipped the script. So I know I talked over you. And you no, know, go ahead. You're good. I got, I got a, um, you know, some tailwind and I just kept going. I will keep you going on your tailwind, you know, and it, it one of the things I want to talk about, I love the counterintuitive piece. And I don't know if you would consider this completely counterintuitive, but one of the things I thought was game changing out of the book, I've never heard anyone talk about it like this before, was when you talk about status alignment. And you correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but yeah. I would like to see a whole book just called status alignment and just your stories about status alignment. But status alignment versus building rapport. I don't know if you'd consider that sort of counterintuitive. Most people go to building rapport. You go... I don't know if that would be a higher level or just different level. Just talk about status alignment versus building rapport. What, what, what's your view on, on, on rapport? What is your view on rapport? Like how do, you, how do you do it? How do you relate to it? So let me critique or yeah. agree with sort of your approach and then I'll tell you my, you know, my approach within that. Yeah. Um, I guess I would, I would say building rapport, just finding a common ground where we both have interests in something. That's how I would... So if you went to University of Wisconsin, I went to University of Wisconsin, I would bring that up to- Did you, you go know, to University of Wisconsin? I did. You yeah. did? Yeah. yeah, so at Madison? Madison, yeah. Yeah, so we were, my dad was a, uh, did his PhD. Oh, really, and, okay. Yeah, very interesting. So maybe that's a good example. So, yeah. you know, and you find a common ground with someone you don't know and you, you start there, somewhere to start, like a starting ground. Yeah, here's the problem. I agree, Jewish geography, university geography, common interest in marlin fishing, you know, you both like skiing. So if it's really there, it's nice to have that relatedness. Here's why people go for rapport. Mm -hmm. They go way beyond that relatedness and they look for and try and force it because they wanna feel safe mm -hmm. and liked and have social acceptance. It is. It is um, acceptance seeking behavior hmm. to explore rapport, you know, for more than 90 seconds, for more than 120 seconds in a meeting, right? Uh, so, and, and the things we, and also weather, and did you watch the Super Bowl? And, uh, you know, can you believe the, uh, the, the upset, you know, the NCAA tournament or whatever? That is not rapport. That is sports and weather and politics. And nobody buys a million dollar thing. Nobody goes, hey, look, uh, you know, Jeremy pitched us on the services. It's a million dollars. We, we, you know, I'm not sure about it. I, you know, I like him as a guy. The, it seems like we already have these services and we don't need them that much. But you know what? He really knows a lot about NCAA basketball <laughs> and then the you know University of Delaware uh, fighting blue hens is is I can't believe he knows about that team. That was my alma mater. Let's do the deal with him. All right. That doesn't happen. So the rapport only makes you feel good 
It burns really valuable minutes. It can feel needy if you're not good at it, and it accomplishes almost nothing. So if it is there, hey, you went to the University of Wisconsin, I went to the University of Wisconsin, super interesting, you know, we'll talk about that at some point. Um, uh, you know, how are you guys sheltering in place? That's great. Fun to have the kids at home. Never spend more time with my little boy. It's amazing the, 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 the things he gets into during the middle of the day. It's like the secret life of cats, but it's your <laughs> little boy. I love it. Anyway, look. Okay, so, so that's, you know, sort of 33 seconds of COVID. It can't feel like, you know, that never happened, but, but most people on the Zoom calls that I get on to turn COVID into pandering. We don't need three, five minutes of commiserating. They know the situation. They're at home with their own kids. They know it's miserable. They know, God, you know, all the old people are going to die. The young people are going to be fine. We need testing. We need contact tracing. Very sorry about your, uh, the, very sorry about the coleslaw and corned beef king of Detroit that passed away this weekend. You heard on NPR. Horrible news. But 74 year old guy ate corned beef his entire life, never worked out a single day you know, passed away from a uh, flu and, and COVID virus. And it's very tragic. Okay. But um, I'm not sure that, that, you know, we need COVID pandering. We don't need weather pandering. So rapport. Um, so it's not just that rapport exudes neediness. It's not that it's just attention seeking or validation seeking behavior. It also uses up time that you could be doing status alignment. Ultimately, and I think, you know, now we've ended up somewhere, no one does a deal easily, smoothly, quickly, at a fair price with someone they believe is lower status than them. They will always be grinding on you if you're in the low status salesman position. So instead of looking for rapport, which does almost nothing, seek to get alignment with them that you are an industry peer that they can do a deal with. That is the magic of what to do in the first three minutes. Not baseball, not weather, not football, not COVID, not University of Wisconsin. You can touch on that, move on. It is, hey, I am your, I'm not a sales guy, although I sell, okay? I'm not an account executive, although I executive the account, right? I'm not here to, um, uh, you know, sell you or offer you something, I'm here to solve your problems in the amount of, I've, right? I've taken some calendar from my calendar and given it to you. And here's what we're gonna do with my time, all right? Does anybody need fluids in or out? If not, let's go. Favorite status alignment story? <clears throat> it could be in the book or not in the book. It could be you or someone you've yeah, consulted is, with. Here's my favorite status alignment story. It's not the story you were expecting, but it's hard for me to remember all this. So we had a client. Uh, I wrote a deck for them. They're in the entertainment industry. They went out and raised $70 million with the deck that I wrote. I got like whatever, hundred grand. You know, I didn't have that time a, a uh, commission or a success fee built in. So I got a hundred thousand dollars. They got 70 million, right? Whatever. Uh, they called me a couple years later with their new CFO, right? So the, 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 my client, John, says, hey, Orrin, we haven't talked in a while. You know, we've been using the deck. We've grown. We've done 30 movies. You know, thanks a lot. I've got the new CFO, Susan, on the line, right? And uh, we want to go out. We want to get you to do some more material. We want to go out and raise some more money. And so we wanted to call. Right? And so, oh, hey, you know, good to talk to you again, John. Glad to get the update. Hi, Susan. And uh, I go, what would you guys like to talk about? So Susan says, well, listen, I think a good place to start is tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, what you do, a little bit about the company and what you think you can do for us. And I go, okay, great. Hey, listen, Susan, I'm not going to do that. Anything else you want to do on this call? <laughs> because. I thought you were going to say something different, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I'm too busy to come in at this level and work and, to, and, and take all the effort and energy to frame myself, explain my successes, what I do, what I don't do in essence, to pitch myself and the company and our last 10 years of work, right? And supplicate to a company that I've already succeeded for. 
And the great thing about this is she sputtered. But what do you mean you're not going to do that? So the reason I tell this story is that is the expectation of everybody coming in as a buyer to you, a CFO, you know, on the analyst side, right? A CFO, someone in HR, legal. Yeah, tell me about yourself. They have put no work into understanding what you do, what you're great at, why the company is considering you, right? If you didn't put any work in, why should I? And I think this is a great you know, thing that you were saying at the beginning of this meeting, in which I was teasing you, is they need to come in primed and understanding your value, your business, what you're capable of, in some way working to understand how to get you on their problems. When they come in and go, tell me about yourself, what is it that you do? This is a horrible starting point. <laughs> and you got to decide, do I want to spend six weeks sort of pitching, multiple phone calls, sending over information, you know, to edge myself up to be credible and, and valuable and appear in the mind of this person, right? So you either have to take them down to where you are um, or, you know, do, so, so in that situation, you said, hey, look, I, I'm not going to do that work. You do the work. I've already performed for the company. Uh, and, and she said, I've never been talked to like that before. And I said, you have now, right? And, and so the great thing about that is, uh, hey, the, my guy, John, said, hey, Orn, can we just put you on hold for three minutes? They went away. They talked. She came back in and sort of made a, um, a you know, sputtered a little bit and said, you know, we're really sorry. I've gotten a little bit better understanding now. We're really interested in getting a proposal from you for raising another $30 million, really appreciate you. So, the, you know, the, so many takeaways in there, but you don't have to answer the questions that the CFOs, the lawyers, and the analysts ask of you. Most of the time, they're intended to reinforce their high status position and continually frame you as the needy, low status, begging for business, trying to win something business. And and both my books, as you know, Pitch Anything and Flip the Script, are, are meant to flip that position where the buyer feels low status. They are trying to get you, your time, your energy, your attention, and your value. How do you do that? Very, you know, through a lot of the mechanisms that we talked about here. You know, I just, I, now, you know, having listened to this, hopefully, you know, you can go back and say, all right, the, the, some mechanisms you can implement immediately. Am I needy? Am I starting the meeting in a high status way? Are my values clear? Am I, is one of my values that I will not work harder on the client's business than they'll work on their own business, right? Am I giving them all the information and the price and then they're just going away to look for something cheaper or better? Or am I really establishing my value and that I know how to solve their problem better than anybody else and I've done it a thousand times before and I'm their peer in this industry. So, uh, uh, and some framework you can put around that, again, is just what we started with. People want what they can't have. You can't just tell them you can buy from me. People chase that which moves away from them. You can't just say, um, so what do you think? Is this something you'd be interested in, right? And people only value what that which they pay for. If you're in the service business, you can't give people um, work product to evaluate, right? The work product is only done when an agreement is made. So hopefully those things were helpful. Yeah, very helpful. Um, did, hey, did Chris, did Chris Voss cover any of that? Uh, we did not talk about status alignment. <laughs> um, why do you think it was important to write the book, um, Flip the Script? You're super busy. You have pro a ton of things that you could be doing. I'm, I'm curious of why. Why put it in the framework? So I went in, uh, when, when my agent talked me to doing a second book, we went and visited uh, a bunch of the publishers in New York. Um, so my existing publisher, my new publisher, went to HarperCollins, and I met with the senior editors at HarperCollins, and they had Gary Vaynerchuk's book, and um, uh, you know, their top publisher. And I told them a little bit about Flip the Script, which at that time was called something different, and the senior editor looked at me and she said, I like you, you're very dynamic. I don't think you have another book in you. And 
I was like, you bitch. <laughs> but you know what? She was right. Flip the script. I wrote once. I was about to send it in and I looked at it and I go, is this truly the follow on to pitch anything? Pitch anything sold a million copies with no marketing. And I looked at it, I said, it's a good book, but it's not pitch anything follow on. So I told the publisher, hey, I'm not ready. And I rewrote it a second time. Totally new book. So a book is 66,000 words. Now I'm at 140,000 words. Finished it, so proud. Uh, took a couple of days off. Got ready to send in my new extended deadline. I read it and I go, I, I like this book, but I don't know if I love it. Mm. And I love pitching it. And so I sat back and I said, this is closer, but this is not it. So I wrote it a third time. I'll never forget this. We were in the uh, Four Seasons in Los Angeles, and I just finished it, like, like in a movie, you know, that the done a typewriter. That thing. <laughs> I go, that is a book I love. I got my little boy. It was like 8, 15 at night. He was, two, he was four years old, um, up too late for his bedtime. And I let him pit, uh, on the mouse, push the send key. You know, this is it. Final manuscript. They're printing it tomorrow. Whatever you send them on this deadline, they're going to print like we're three deadlines too late. And so I wrote the book three times. So she was right. I didn't have pitch anything went like this. Boom. It just came out like all this has to come out. This is how the world works. Flip the script was much more intentional to find those kernels of really useful, actionable things that can be done yeah. today to make money and yeah. close deals. Because some so, things you do naturally, and you were trying to figure out what you were actually doing. But pitch anything I, I knew, flip the script, I really had to unpack what is going on here when I do these things, and it took, so it took almost 300,000 words to find 66,000 mm. words that really explained mm. these formulas, but it is quite magical. Do you, at what point do you remember a point where you figured out that status alignment piece? Because it's probably something you just do naturally when you approach someone you're talking to them. Here is where I figured it out. Not so much on the first call, right? But I'm not in a one call closed business. We don't sell cars. We don't sell TVs, right? We, uh, we help people sell their company. And there's multiple meetings over a couple weeks. And so... What I felt was it was pretty easy to get that first call. It was easy to have that first meeting. And then the degradation rate or the fall off rate was way too high. Right. And so I was as familiarity breeds contempt as they knew what I had, they knew our capabilities. They started looking around at other companies measuring us. It was harder and harder to get them back on the phone because they felt we were, you know, I was a salesperson. So I said this, the problem is, the status that I have on the first call is going down to the point where I can't get them on the call again and they're controlling me. So that's when I realized the element that always brings people back to calls, you know, and continues to sell moving on is status. It's not value. The value you have is pretty much available everywhere. People come to a call to be with an expert who is charismatic, who understands their problem, who is high status, who is not needy, who lots of people work with, and who they feel like they are chasing to get to work on their deal. That's why people come to calls, not to hear about value and price. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think, again, I, I think everyone should get flipped the script. Um, just for that one piece, I mean, the whole book is great. In, it's a really good storytelling book you will not be bored at all for just from the get-go um from the the whole russian um story the you know or i was doing i was watching a video of you talking and, and this really struck me um you had to make a tough decision and um i don't know if you remember but you had to close 10 million dollars in by 3 p.m yeah and what struck me was the very end of the video where you decide to just walk away. And I'm curious of the three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, Oren versus today, Oren. I don't know if you want to talk about the decision you made yeah. at that, that time. Was, yeah, yeah I, did, I did walk away from that money and I've walked away from a lot of money for the same reason. And that's a, that's a good video. 
uh, so, and have you, have you got kids and you've got a family there? You're, yeah. Uh, how many kids do you have? Two, six and eight year old. Six and eight. I mean, you probably don't like your kids that much, but I love, no, just kidding. Sometimes that is true. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I have one little boy and he was a magical gift. Um, we, I got married very late in life and my wife and our similar age. And we uh, basically were not, not sure, you know, that we were going to get a family, not sure we wanted a family, you know, but we got a little boy hmm. and every single cliche that ever existed in every romantic comedy about stepping on Legos and waking up in the middle of the night and a robot starting to talk to you and you're hitting it with a baseball bat and the police coming and arresting you and the neighbor and alarms going off and uh, getting pee in your face and diapers, like every single funny cliche is actually true, as you know. And I have reprioritized my life from I gotta make a hundred million dollars, I gotta make a billion dollars, I gotta close every deal, I need every plane and car and toy and house and mansion to, I don't care. I mean, I have some of that, but I don't care. What I care about is time with my little boy and my family, and I prioritize that. And so, if you are driving through Los Angeles, you know, past UCLA and you look under the bridge and you see someone looking like me wearing a baseball hat, you know, and eating some old McDonald's fries out of a used uh, McDonald's um, uh, bag, right? And you said, you'll, you'll know it's true <laughs> that I prioritize everything um, over my work. The work is important, but really, uh, the, the, as you have a family and as you have kids, it reprioritizes what you're willing to do and what you're willing to, you know, how much work you're willing to work for. So now I walk away from a lot of deals if they're going to take time away from my family. Now, did that change overnight or was that, because listen, you've been you for no. many years, right? Yeah. I, the, um, I don't really like the interview with you because you're asking um, very personal questions and I seem to be answering them. So you've got some kind of hypnotism okay. going on, but, I, but I've never said this before, but I think the day after the baby was born, I flew to Oregon, to Portland and ran a two day board meeting for a company. And they said, didn't you just have a baby? I'm like, yeah, what am I gonna do with a baby? Right. And, and so it did, it, cause I didn't really understand the baby. I never had a baby before. I don't really like babies. Uh, and, and I didn't really understand the baby and you know, the new baby and there with his mom. Um, but, but uh, over time, yes, I would say, you know, it did, it shifted. And today you would need a, a wrecking crew to pull me away one minute of committed time to my little boy and my wife to get me to go do some work. Yeah. We often ask questions of sometimes we personally need the answer to. So I was just curious um, yeah. on that. And, you know, it is tough because you have a certain mentality, you have a certain work ethic, you have a certain way you've done things for so many years, and it's just, it's hard to just, at a snap of a finger, I think, change that. It, it is, you know, it is. And then, and then, you know, now you say, okay, I want to do my workouts, I want to get sleep, I want to meditate, I want to spend time with my family, I want to eat well, you know, I want to go on vacation. Um, sorry, when do you work? <laughs> right? And so that is when you have to start becoming very intentional about your work, very programmatic about what you do, and you just spend a small amount of time really being uh, effective when you, you know, when you have infinite time, um, it, 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 that's where a lot of these tools and systems came from that are in my book, from having less and less and less time and needing to be as effective. Yeah. You know, first of all, Orrin, I want to thank you. I, I have two last questions that sure. I always ask on Sparta Insider, but I want to just tell people, check out pitchmastery.com, check out orinclaff.com, that's K-L-A-F-F.com, pitchanything.com. I'm telling you, I don't say this lightly, you need to get pitch anything. Flip the script, uh, I'm on my, I've already listened to it two times. Is that valuable that I would spend time listening to it two times? And I think everyone should. Um, so check out Flip the Script. And I look forward to seeing the movie. There should be a movie. Now, you know, incorporating that family, like all you just, all that stuff you just said of the young Oren evolving into, into the current Oren, you know, but, um, so everyone check out everything he has to offer on his site. But, um, Oren, the last two questions I was asking since Spart Insider is, you know, what's been a really challenging low moment that you had to push through 
And on the flip side, what's been an especially proud moment that you had through this, the whole journey? Yeah, I think, you know, the story I told you when I got off the board of this company uh, that we were trying to sell with the $6 million fee, it wasn't just the fee. I've worked on it for over two years. And so to, you know, and, and just going, I just worked on a fucking deal for two years with half my time. What else could I have done with that time? Family, self, work, contribution, community, relationships, you know, instead of working on a crappy, you know, medical services. So, so that was a low point for sure. I woke up and going two years, gone. Um, and certainly, you know, a high point. Real was, quick on the low point, Warren, yeah. how do you then, you know, your mentality, how do you actually come back quick? What do you tell yourself? Is there self-talk after that? Because you could, you could dwell on, I just spent two years and, and sit in a corner but I'm assuming, I know you probably don't do that. So what are you telling yourself internally to just get out of that? Four words. Life is not fair. Hmm. Look around. We're in Southern California, driving XYZ cars, living by the beach, got a beautiful family, you know, shopping at Whole Foods, doing work I love. Uh, certainly a setback, but you don't, you don't deserve anything. There's no written in the Talmud or the book of life that you are going to get success or money or love or appreciation or, or long life. Right. And, and, you know, lots of people did woke up today dead. <laughs> okay. And so life is not fair. You get what you, you know, like my little boy says, you get what you get and you don't complain. I don't really pres prescribe to that. You see, I complain a lot, but you get what you get. And normally you get what you get because you let it happen. And so, so anyway, um, yeah, life is not fair. You're, then, you, you know, just stoic philosophy, just compartmentalize. You have to, if you talk to anybody who's been in um, a white collar crime lawsuit, right? Um, and I've interviewed some of those people. They, it's just so overwhelming, right? And they, they just, you have to compartmentalize your life and say, this is this. And this is this. So compartmentalize. Life is not fair. Get back in the game. Um, and this is one thing I say: like once you're in the game, once you're in the, once you're, you know, you know, you're in the cockpit and you're shooting bullets and stuff to come to you, and adrenaline's going, you're fine, right? It's walking up to the cockpit, strapping in, putting your hands on the gun when there's no enemies around. That that's when you're afraid. But once you're in it, you're in it. And and so it's just getting back in it and and recognizing well, life is not fair. Thank you know you. the the, yeah. um, the upside. Uh, the high, you know, the, the highlights are, um, I think the, uh, oh, this is great. I'll just tell you this and we got to wrap up on my, I'm sure yeah. I'm tired. So, so, um, I had built my little boy, uh, for his third birthday, a monster truck, like truly a giant truck. And up to three, I mean, when a kid's two, they're basically a sea cucumber, like they can talk, <laughs> but you're not talking to, you're not having conversations. Right. So I showed him a picture of it, but he couldn't, you know, anyway, if you have a two year old, you know, but then, uh, he told his mom, dad built me a monster truck. And that was like a huge moment because, because what happened is he was taking information and then relating it to someone else. And of course she said, your dad would not build you a monster truck, right? You need to learn what a toy is, right? And what's <laughs> not a toy. And so he got in trouble. He's like, no, I saw it. It's real. But that I just realized like this human is now communicating with other humans and I have to be careful about what I tell him. He's not just <laughs> one way, you know, messaging system. Now messages are coming out. And that was, uh, uh, you know, not a business highlight, but no, oh, totally. Yeah. it comes full circle. Oren, I want to be the first one to thank you. Check out pitchmastery.com, orenclaff.com, pitchanything.com. Definitely flip the script. Thanks, Oren. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same and right.